Um, so we're here at the Makando Literary Festival and today we're going to be talking about the history of stories. And to discuss this topic with me today, I have the amazing, wonderful, beautiful Yvonne Adiambo Owo. Kenya's pride and shining light. And uh, what they say here, because if we're going to read all her accomplishments, it's going to be like a very long session. And we have only an hour, so I'm just going to read the short notes they gave us about Yvonne. Yvonne is a passionately patriotic Kenyan, and I can testify to that, you know, because I know all her secrets. And the co-founder of the Makando Book, Big Book Society. She's also the author, author of the novels The Dragonfly Sea, 2019, and you should read that. And Dust, 2013, which you should also read. The letter was shortlisted for the Folio Prize. She won the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2003 for the first short story she ever published. Isn't she lucky? Talented as well. And um, so she's, uh, she participated in the prestigious Iowa Writers Program in 2005 and again in 2017 when she returned to teach the Autumn Creative Writing class at Greenell College, Iowa, as a visiting professor. Her work has appeared in Max Sweeney's and other publications. She has been a TED, TEDx Nairobi speaker and a Lanan Foundation resident. Yvonne lives at home in Nairobi. <laughs> and our next panelist is the amazing, wonderful, brilliant, sometimes intimidating Peter Kimani. <laughs> Peter Kimani is the author of Dance of the Jacaranda. And uh, I remember first hearing about the book in Nigeria, and it was just all over the place. And I'm like, who is this guy? Right. And it's a pleasure meeting him for the first time yesterday. Peter Kimani, really great to meet you. Um, Peter is a novelist, journalist, and scholar. How does one person do all of that? He is currently a faculty member at Aga Khan University in Nairobi. As Kenyan literary icon Ngojiwa Tiongo, who Peter considers to be his mentor, predicted that his future would lie between hard covers. And that has been come, uh, become being confirmed true. You know, um, he had to prove him right with Dance of the Jacaranda, 2018, a fine work of historical fiction. Peter also writes nonfiction, poems, and plays, and sometimes very angry essays as well. <laughs> so these are my panelists for today. Um, and, and just to give you a sense of their works, and I'm sure most of you have read both, both books, or all three books, um, I'll invite... Um, Yvonne to start with a reading from one of her books, and then Peter is going to give us a short reading as well. So, floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. So, good afternoon. So, where shall I, which one shall I read from? Dust or Dragonfly Sea? Oh, okay, Dragonfly Sea. <laughs> uh, um, is there any particular section you'd like to hear in Dragonfly Sea? <laughs> okay, uh, I don't know which one that would be. Okay, I'll, I'll, but you guys have heard enough of the start, right? So we can, let's do someone else. Those of you who have read it, and you are one of your favorite, pick, pick a favorite, pick a character you like so that I can concentrate on him or her. Mohidin. Oh, okay, okay. Yay, okay. The morning when the man from China entered Kenya, inside, inside a spacious lime-washed bedroom within a wood and coral two-story house, located, oh, that's page, page eight. Located in a 12-house maze in Pate Town, still chiseled by trade winds named Kusi, Matlai, Malelezi, and Kaskazi, an aging seaman, Muhidin Badawi Mlingoti, dreamt again 
that he was circumnavigating a gigantic sapphire mountain at the bottom of the sea. He carried a map in the dream. It was inside a dark brown book and contained arcane words that lit up as if inflamed. The real version of his dream map was under his bed, inside an ornate mahogany lamu chest bundled up in a dark green cloth. Five years back, Muhyiddin, the sun blackened, salt water seared, bug eyed, and brawny descendant of Pate Island fishermen and boat builders, had swiped this book from one of thousands in the private library of a Dubai based war and sea bounty collector to whom Muhyiddin would sometimes sell contraband artifacts. Inside the book's pages, he had found a beguiling yellow brown parchment with map like markings in a cryptic language that featured the emblem of an archaic compass that indicated the east as the starting point for all movement. When Muhyiddin first examined the parchment, he had imagined it was written out in musical notation. Later, he saw that when exposed to dusk's light, the parchment emi emitted an intimate utter that evoked sandalwood. What was it? A memory map's pain to trade winds, ports, and travelers? What if the frag fragment was a flavored piece from a foolish tale? One of the interminable Alpha Lela Ulela, Thousand and One Nights gossip sheets? It is nothing, Muhyiddin told himself, to assuage his lust to know. It is nothing. Still, whenever Muhyiddin fell foul of the haunted realms of his heart, he would automatically reach under the bed to retrieve the book and touch the parchment for reassurance. Long, long ago, when Muhyiddin was no more than a boy, a fierce song had burnt into his being. It had clung to him like an earth-stranded ghost. It would later re-emerge as dreams that woke him up with a craving for unnameable things. The song would turn an illiterate island boy into a seeker, traveler, reader, and sleuth, a hungry truth hunter. Muhyiddin Hamis Mlingotiwa Badawi had been orphaned when a Likoni South Coast ferry sank with his parents and five siblings. Through this tragedy, his childless relatives, Uncle Hamid, a Zumari player and a master boatman, and his wife Zainab, acquired a punching bag and an indentured servant. However, during a four-day fishing trip with his uncle in the middle of a thrashing, rolling, wrestling match with an enraged giant black marlin, goaded by his uncle's baleful threats, dare you lose my fish, dare you, the terror-stricken 14-year-old had slipped into a state of high concentration, inside of which whisperings, as if from the source of life, bubbled forth. In these, he heard a palpable sea song which sucked him into the soul of a single wet note made out of the contents of time. The song penetrated his young heart, which proceeded to shatter and scatter as portions of infinite sun across chilled worlds. From that moment, Muhyiddin would be struck with a perpetual homesickness for an unknown place. Suddenly docile, the fish had yielded its life. Afterwards, a desultory silence. Then Muhyiddin had tumbled about the boat, keening, the bitter sound drenching his wrink wrinkled uncle Hamid, who contemplated Muhyiddin with very old, very dark, very cheerless eyes. It's nothing, the uncle grunted five nights later. The disarray of wind. But the uncle and his wife never touched Muhyiddin again. The emotion of the event had later pressed Muhyiddin into the sea's service where he would work non-stop, an enchanted captive. Whenever he reached land, he darted after illusions as if they were fireflies. He dredged dark no no nooks in port cities, buying, bartering, stealing, and scrounging for maps and riddles. He scoured notations, hoping to signpost existence. Destination, certainty. In this quest, Muhyiddin rubbed skin with both man and matter, and finally they, not the sea, would rip the fabric of his being. So many year, sea years later, a world bruised Muhyiddin, buffeted by endless solitude, would again encounter reverberations from that odd day. 
He was aboard his merchant vessel on a frigid, vile-tempered, night-blackened Atlantic. He had, as usual, assumed duty on the ship's storm watch, when from within seething seas he glimpsed blue spherical lights gambling on water. He had blinked as they disintegrated into fractions of the ghost song he had once heard. He had leaned over the railings, baying, Who are you? A two-story wave had swamped the ship's deck and drenched him before retreating. Muhyiddin was at once overcome by a yearning for the island home he had abandoned. Everything he had found so far only hinted at what the ocean's formless song was not. He had no high faith to find shelter in either. This he had earlier offloaded in an Alexandrian souk where an alabaster-skinned vendor of everything with a sepulchral hawkish nose, had delicately avoided contact with Muhyiddin's skin. The souk, a call to prayer had resounded. The warm-voiced invitation to souls to gather clashed with the chaos of small bad human habits. Like the word, word that the trader whose goods Muhyiddin had spurned had then let slip. Abd, slave. And inside Muhyiddin something had detonated. He had ground his teeth. Bloodthirsty gin, executioner, gobbler of souls. The trader's glass, glassy-eyed smile, he, he stuttered. Abd, my friend, you know, my friend, brother, it means, it means submission to the will. Muhyiddin had roared, stop thief, atone, stink of putrefaction beneath white, wo white robes, walking cemetery, mutu muovu, imbibe of human blood, atone, parasite, so you won't touch my hand? Its blackness condemns you? Atone, thief of land and soul. Atone. Fear had distorted the trader's face. Licking his lips, he had whispered to Muhyiddin, Look, look. He zig zigzag backward. He did not close his stall. His arm pointed in all directions, but the others in the market pretended neither to see nor to hear. Their faces lowered to avoid Muhyiddin's incandescent gaze. Muhyiddin had stomped away, clutching his halwa. His body's trembling had dislodged the vestiges of faith to which he had clung. Abd, Muhyiddin's uncle had called him Abd for most of his life, until the day of the fishing trip. It was the name he knew from growing up on an island where spoken words could become a covenant and a bond. Kafir, his uncle had added, heathen, using such soft notes while he thrashed Muhyiddin, and Aunt Zainab just looked at the bleeding boy as she slurped down heavily sugared ginger coffee. This was the face of loneliness, then the substance of his present then, then, then the substance of his present disquiet. Images. Uncle Hamid, musical fisherman, crouching in white robed prayer, a Zahiba as a Biba on his forehead, hiding the truth of a bloodthirsty will. Abd. Muhyiddin had strict stridden through that souk, the halwa perfuming him with sweetness and a vow on his tongue. Between religion and my black skin, there will shall be a sky's distance until the day I hear the call to atonement. Oh, thank you, Yvonne. She kept going on and on and on, and it was beautiful. Um, so, Peter, could you read us something, please? Uh, good afternoon. Do you have any preference between the two main time frames uh, in the Jacaranda, 1900 and uh, 1963? Do you have any preference? 1900. 1900. Okay. Yeah, and it's a joy to read before my own mother. <laughs> That's for you to discover. <laughs> um, and very dear friend. Sorry, I, I'm going to use my power as the moderator to demand that Peter Kimani's mother please stand up for acknowledgement. Yeah. <laughs> Our mother, please. If you think I'm stubborn, she's more stubborn, so <laughs> good luck. <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> Congratulations, ma'am. It's not easy having a son like this. <laughs> All right, so I'll, um, I'll start from the beginning. This is the opening chapter. 
In that year, the glow worms in the marshes were replaced by light bulbs. Villagers were roused out of their hamlets by a massive rumbling that many mistook for seismic shifts of the earth. These were not uncommon occurrences. Locals experienced earthquakes across the Rift Valley so often they even had an explanation for it. They said it was God taking a walk in his universe. They believed this without needing to see it, but on that day, the villagers saw the source of the noise as well. It was a monstrous, snake-like creature whose black head, erect like a cobra's, pulled rusty brown boxes and slithered down the savannah, coughing spasmodically as it emitted blue-black smoke. The villagers clapped their hands and, and wailed, Yokine, come and see! The strips of iron that strange men had planted seasons earlier, which left undisturbed, had grown into a monster gliding through the land. The gigantic snake was a train, and the year was 1901, an age when white men were still discovering the world for their kings and queens in faraway lands. I'll skim quickly to 1963. And uh, music is very central to this book, so I'll, I'll give you a segment from inside um, this establishment called the Jacaranda, where music is being performed. And the musician uh, Rajan is the main, the main act on the stage. He walked up to the microphone on stage and adjusted it to his height. He was small-bodied, like a stunted teen, with a clutch of jet black hair held at the back by a red, gold, and green hairband. When fans saw him for the first time, they often remarked that fame does not match its owner, for his frame came up short of his towering reputation. The instruments were building in tempo. Rajan trembled with delight and nodded appreciatively to the instrumentalists, tapping his right foot, responding to a rhythm that appeared to bubble deep inside him. In his formative years as a singer, Rajan would shake with fright before the curtains opened, unsure how the audience might respond. Sometimes, Lines that he had rehearsed for weeks would evaporate at the sight of hundreds of eyes. Now he was a lot more composed, but the dread of performing a show really never left him. It helped when he was under the influence of something. Steam is what they called preconcert intoxication. He had had a few beers to unlock his mind. Rajan let the instruments play on, the squeak from the keyboard the wail of the guitar and the throb of the drums building into a frenzy. He yanked the microphone from its stand and walked to the edge of the platform as dozens of hands rushed to touch him. He crooned in a low, mournful voice. Baruana kutumia ni kufunze ya dunia Usije uka angamia Ewe wangwe Ewe Nawe Uwe wangwe Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Sometimes you think writers are boring people, and they surprise you in amazing ways. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for the beautiful readings. Um, I suppose I should start asking, because we're supposed to talk about the history of stories. Um, but I'd like to start by asking you the history of your characters. Like, how did they come to you? I ask because in, in The Dragonfly Sea and, and in uh, The Dance of the Jacaranda, you you wrote characters that were unlike you, uh, even though they are Kenyans, right? Um, but you wrote about an Indian character, and you wrote about uh, 
the islander who is you know people wouldn't say well this is a, a typical kenyan right so how did you conceive these characters what were their histories um i mean the writing process i, I wish i knew how how they came about <laughs> that's a mystery of the process you really have no idea because you're writing to discover so um my I had, a loose, I had a loose historical figure that I was interested in. Um, uh, but Rajan, who is the main, uh, one of the main characters here, uh, you can say he's an amalgamation of many personalities yeah. embodied in one. Um, I mean, it's more, it's more interesting to explore a personality you're not aware about and their desires. You invest in them, uh, what you want them to pursue, or what they feel is important in their lives. Um, but I can say I drew from um, uh, the presence of uh, Indians in East Africa. So this was a, a cultural context outside my own. Uh, so I had I had very little um, uh, very little material that I knew about, and I had to research. I had to interview friends from that community. I had to I had to um, just let them be, and they led me to where yeah. the story actually resides. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, Peter, Peter's kind of answered it. It's the whole thing of the mystery of, you, you have no idea where, you know, I'm sure you've also experienced it. You have no idea where, where this character comes from and he suddenly shows up, whether in dreams or on the page. And, uh, and you have a sense of, of their story, their, uh, you know, and listening into what they want of you. So th that's one way. But having said that, um, the idea of the amalgam of characters Certainly, the character of Muhyiddin is influenced by um, one of the finest human beings I have encountered, uh, the poet uh, Haji Gorahaji from Zanzibar. Uh, I used to call him my old man of the sea. He, actually, he was my old man <laughs> uh, in, in so many ways, but really, um, he personifies and most emblematic of the old man of the sea. And when I was uh, researching this story, he was my main interlocutor. Um, and Muhyiddin is very much uh, built around some of the things he said, uh, uh, the sense of mischief and naughtiness, and, and, and uh, uh, he, he feels as if he's a sea creature, uh, as, as you know, Haji Gorahadi feels completely like a sea creature that happens to be on the land, and he, even his language, it, it drips with the, with the sense of the sea. So I hope I captured, I did some justice um, um, that encounter in framing the character of Mohede. Fantastic. So, so you know, in capturing these characters, you kind of capture their history as well, and that is the history of a people, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, did you worry about this question of cultural appropriation that people tend to ask? Because we live in an age of protectionism, right, where everybody wants to protect something, mm -hmm. and people feel like our histories are ours to tell. Um, did you have this fear, and what have what has been the reaction of people from this? Um, demography that you captured in your works? Um, for me, I think the Indian uh, community who've read and uh, reached out, uh, you know, reached out to me by writing or stopping me and saying, you know, I read, I read your book, um, has been uh, really uh, a gratitude. I've been met with gratitude. I haven't, um, I haven't encountered that at all. Uh, one of my one of my best uh, responses was when I met some young man who grew up in Thika, which is in central Kenya, where I grew up as well. And he told me his father sent him, sent him my book, you know, the Jacaranda, and said, this is your story. And then he said, now I don't have to write my story because you've done it for me. Yeah. Um, so, or, uh, you know, some, write, some, some reader from Trinidad writing and saying, you know, I read and I thought for a while you're Indian. <laughs> and yeah. until I, I, I looked at your bio and I thought, uh, you know, you've captured the spirit of the community. So, uh, a cultural appropriation is, uh, is a delicate topic, uh, but it's also a foolish uh, argument to make. Because uh, I think, um, <laughs> forgive my bluntness, uh -huh. but <laughs> I warned you. Yeah. So, um, uh, but uh, but I think it's about uh, um, the Indian story is as Kenyan as my own story. Yeah, it it is uh, you know part of uh, the collective that forms Kenyan uh, Kenyan story or Kenyan history. So, what I've found interesting is actually 
uh, indigenous Kenyans questioning why I wrote about <laughs> the Indian yeah. note. But then you see, it's also a limiting way of reading the book because you have uh, British ca characters, you have uh, Scottish characters, you have Indians, you have Arabs, you have Africans. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm looking at the entire spectrum. And I think the point that I was trying to do um, or to make with the Jacaranda is to talk about a collective identity that's Kenyan uh, beyond uh, these linear and uh, very, very narrow um, you know, categorizations that defined colonization of Kenya. Yeah. I'm struck, Peter, by how much uh, uh, how much our muses are influenced by the same thing. Yes, yeah. and and uh, again, very much what he has said is some of what I could also say about both Dragonfly C and the character of Muhyiddin. Um, uh, and and adding to that, um, uh, sometimes I guess yeah, I, having lived so long in my imagination. Uh, uh, and, and traveled a lot in my own imagination many times because I love the ocean. Um, I've wanted to, to imagine myself as a, uh, as a sailor, as a boat, uh, as a boat man. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, uh, and I think the, the gift of the literary space allows one to be that which one had always wanted. Imagine one could also be, but, but, and, uh, yeah, it's, and and as as Peter also says, it's a, it's also a, a reclamation. The, but the point was simply that as a Kenyan, part of the exploration of um, what what it means to be Kenyan and what it means to be East African and even African, um, for me in in terms of um, the writer's journey, is the reclamation of the seas, of my seas. Um, uh, and and in in encountering Haji Gora Haji. I was struck by my own ignorance and by how much I did not, how much I had, how do you say, amputated myself uh, from that extended sense of, of, of self and identity. In terms of reaction and response, um, so far it has been kind and generous and uh, again, um, I, I hope I did justice to the, um, uh, if you want, the intimacies of the culture. Um, that I had dared to walk into, and but very much uh, my own opinion about the whole debate around cultural appropriation. I let others debate it. I really don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's shocking how much anger you see when people want to talk about appropriation and all of that. So it's it's amazing that that you have the courage to kind of you know challenge the stereotypes, challenge this ideology, and challenge this notion of anger. And and I feel most of this anger, in my opinion, is, is a pretense. It's, you know, like, I have to pretend to be angry so that you take me seriously mm -hmm. for whatever reason, because I think we're in an age of, of uh, reality TV, mm -hmm. right, which is the rave. And those who can be on reality TV are on social media, and they enact their own performance of anger, you know. Uh, which, which for me is a very interesting uh, subject to consider. But uh, I'm going to ask this question now, um, because even though your works are very different, there are kind of similarities, right? And I, and I see you as being on opposite ends of a spectrum, in the sense that um, in Dust, for instance, you talk about, uh, you have this composite characters uh, in Odidi and his sister Ajani, who is the main character. Um, you know, where it's kind of difficult to place them, like what tribe are they, or, you know, but they're Kenyans, right? And um, in, in Peter Kimani's book, we see how this composition of people starts, right? When you have all these people coming together and then cohabiting and then, you know, producing generations of people that are, you know, uniquely different. How, how do you, you know, reconcile this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll rephrase the question. Right? So I'm saying that uh, for me, you know, Peter Kimani goes back to the origin. Right. You, in a way, talk about the end product of that cohabitation of people. Right. You know, so how how do you you know figure out this composition? How relevant do you think it is to the history? Why is it important right. that you kind of dissect this? You know. Uh, and I think Kenyans will identify this. Um, the the assumption of a kind of uh, I I don't know a purified purified 
a decanted Kenyan um, that has got a, a, a very a, a linear, you know, site of origin, has been used to create a sense of privileging of who to whom this country belongs to. Right, uh, it's a madness. Actually, it's a, it's an insanity that, unfortunately, come election election time, uh, becomes entrenched as as a, a, as a fiction that's believed in, at least for the for the season of the election, um, and it's created so much pain and and it's and it's shed so much blood uh, in in a country that's actually a treasure trove. Um, so. It's it's kind of my raging against this lie and the and the fact of our 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 blends. There is nothing like a pure Kenyan, quite frankly. We there is incredible blends, uh, and, and DNA keeps proving that over and over. Uh, DNA tests keep proving that over and over again, or even uh, genealogical histories. Okay, um, and I worry that the entrenchment of um, of or the ethnicization of the the blend that actually is the wealth of this there is the wealth of this nation um, uh, if perpetuated if if the stupidity is perpetuated generation after generation uh, by in in too short a time we will have nothing left we won't even have a country uh, or or a sense of each other um, and it's I you know this is this is a kind of raging and kind of saying okay let's look at ourselves again quite frankly there is no pure luo or pure this or pure I don't know pure barana yeah. um, but then what does what then that what then does that mean in terms of um, uh, belonging in terms of um, um, uh, place the place we occupy in terms of relationship with one another I totally agree. My, um, I think my point of departure was actually in uh, 2008, uh, which is also, uh, you know, where dust uh, takes off. So I went to Iowa in 2007. The same program that Yvonne <laughs> had taken, did you go? Two, uh, two years earlier. Uh, so when I started writing this, uh, this book, and um, uh, the commitment uh, from the program was to write a story that you can read in public before you leave uh, your fellowship. Mm -hmm. So I started a story, and then I returned home in December of that year, and we had elections and uh, the the meltdown. So, and I couldn't return to this story for five years. Uh, so I had a mental freeze. I wrote other things. I wrote poetry. I wrote for children, but I couldn't return to adult fiction because I couldn't comprehend what had happened to the country that I thought I knew, yeah. you know, for nearly uh, maybe 40 years. Uh, so when I returned to it, I looked at Kenya from a very diff different frame because my imagined history had been, uh, those presumptions had been challenged in a very deep way. Yeah. So the story that I wrote was actually to try and clarify to myself, what's Kenya really? Where did it come from? Where are we headed? And I think um, I, I wrestled with that idea for a while. I can hear some affirmation <laughs> <laughs> from the audience. Yeah. And I found uh, to understand where, where we were in 2008, you had to go back to 1890s yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and the 70 years of British occupation of Kenya and the kind of legacy that they left. And one of them, uh, we're not just talking of social identity mm. or a cultural identity, but even economic prosperity for the nation. Mm because the centerpiece of these uh, contestations uh, come election time are not about uh, culture or language, it's about the bread. Yeah. Who is, who, who, who is right. eating Who is eating uh, more than the rest and who has access yeah. to more resources? Yeah. And I found the economic trajectory set in the 1890s by the colonialists, which, which is the railway, uh, and which I think by British editors found a very good metaphor, you know, the train is a snake. Yeah as a serpent uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the, the beast that, uh, you know, takes all that the land can produce and ships it out. So we maintain for 50 years the same economic trajectory, the same economic plan that the colonialists had laid. So they had laid the rail along all productive lands. They didn't go to the hinterland, they didn't go to northeastern yeah. parts where there was nothing to be harvested. Mm -hmm. So we maintain that uh, economic trajectory because every uh, train station evolved in into a township, and that remained the face of modern Kenya. So it's a uh, it's a shame that we took uh, you know 50 years to make these amends to recognize that uh, 
the security and safety and survival of the nation depended on all of us feeling we have a collective stake. Uh, so as a journalist, I've traveled to almost every part of this country and uh, Northeastern province did not have an inch of tarmac until about 10 years ago. So how do they feel they have a collective uh, stake to the, the state that's Kenya? So you see, Kenya is a fictive contrast, uh, construct. Uh, and then we have layers now of additional layers of um, you know facades uh, that uh, that uh, now as a writer you have to peer through all these, uh, cut through uh, colonial history, national histories that are constructed to perpetuate the same misconceptions about our, our past, for us to envision a different future for this country. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting the. Um ideology behind um, building the railway during the colonial era because in Nigeria you have a similar situation where the railways lead to the hinterlands where you could, you know, the British want something they could take and they all lead to the port, right? So you have railway tracks going to Kano to carry granite down south and then you have railways passing through Jos to carry tin which they mine and then go down to Potaka to where they are shipped to the UK and elsewhere. So it's, it's really interesting um, how this setup was, was, was put in place. But what I want to ask now is, um, you know, for Yvonne, especially in Dust, um, the story starts in 2007, the post-election violence. And uh, I, I suppose for Peter as well, that also raised questions, right? So to what extent would you say that certain national events make you question national issues and make you want to interrogate these issues through literature? I think it's, it's, it happens all the time. Uh, Dust and even, even the Dragonfly Sea, it wasn't, it was a more quiet and national event, but it wasn't a significant national event. Um, but certainly I think uh, 2007 and 2008 was a major turning point for um, uh, many in this country, Kenya. Um, it was the first time that our mythology of being, what is, what is that phrase we love so much? Island of peace in a sea of turmoil. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 yes, that, that, that came, sh that shattered so completely. Um, the understanding, I think, the, re the shock, the assumption that the paternal leader would always do everything to stop the country from heading to an, an abyss, that also shattered because we, we watched our own leaders become so obturate in their positions uh, and were willing to dra drive this country into the abyss um, uh, uh, um, for their own personal interests. So that, again, so uh, what was lost immediately was the trust in the fatherhood, father figure, and I use that very wildly um, um, uh, uh, of, of the leader of the nation. So there are a lot of mythologies about um, the certainty of a country that exists were that, that, that was also destroyed. I remember I was a part of a group of Kenyans, and I, I hear this story repeated a few times, between the time of our turmoil, December to maybe about February, those of us who were traveling out of the country, also within the region, um, certainly a few of us who were on a plane to, to Dar es Salaam, I think we got into the shock of realizing nobody is interested in you if, if your country fails. And a lot of resentments that people hold about you certainly emerge when they realize that you, were, you probably are, you know, have no country to go back to. We were held back. Uh, the, 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 the Tanzanian custom official boarded the plane, offloaded, asked everybody else who was non-Kenyan, to leave the plane, so they process them first. And then the group of Kenyans, and we were just simply trying to go and do our business there. Um, we, were, we were then allowed, allowed to disembark, um, and uh, then we we'll proceed, you know, all of us, uh, we we'll, we'll proceeded to get heckled in, in a kind of way, and you couldn't say a word. It was the sense of the certainty that, yes, our country is falling apart, you cannot reply. Whereas before, we'd have been very defiant and very Kenyan about the kind of how dare you. You just say, okay, Niniwa Kenya this, Niniwa Kenya that, and you just you just put your head down. I just hope that you'd be processed. I think it was a moment of understanding for me that nobody wants a person who comes from a failed nation. So uh, yeah, so in a way, yeah. this becomes a kind of fight to say, okay, guys, we've nowhere else to go. Um, and despite what people, what you think, you're actually not wanted if you lose your country. Uh, so we better buckle up and fix this place, quite frankly. 
Yeah, so I have, um, I have similar experiences. So I work in a, a school that has, you know, a satellite uh, campuses elsewhere in the world. So uh, I remember anytime there is a, some anxiety in the nation, uh, you have expatriates <laughs> getting getting uh, their tickets ready. <laughs> so so I keep saying, you know, I have I have nothing else but this. Yeah. So you come here when things are good, mm -hmm. but when things are tough, uh, you know, you're ready to disembark and uh, you know find jet country. out, find a, a, another country to relocate to. So I think for me, um, what my fiction does uh, is to try to restore our history, our national histories, mm -hmm. uh, from the colonial distortions uh, that have been perpetuated by the state. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, the, uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, uh, this patriarch uh, that, uh, that takes care of the nation, the, mm -hmm. the father of the nation. Mm -hmm. my, uh, actually, my book has a, a metaphorical birth um, where some paternity is disputed. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and all I'm saying is, uh, in very plain terms, I'm asking, um, who is truly the father of this nation? Mm -hmm. yeah. did, we, did we sire a bastard? And, uh, and, uh, and if so, um, don't we need to call this kid you know, by its right name? So uh, what, uh, what I try to, uh, to, 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 to tease out is uh, the idea of this institution of uh, you know founding fathers of the nation is all a myth. I mean, it was just uh, last night having a, a conversation with a historian, some some guy who's doing some 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 research on uh, the Kapenguria trial of 1952, uh, where some of those founding figures of the nation were incarcerated on trumped up charges, and it appeared um, at the very very patriarch of the nation was actually on the take, he was being paid, he was jailed, but he was being uh, paid about 650 pounds in 1952 for his silence and cooperation. He even had conjugal rights. <laughs> how many, how many det detainees do that? So, so, so we've been lionizing crooks, yeah. if I may, if I may uh, uh, you know, charlatans, who've, uh, who've uh, been, uh, been uh, you know, put on the pedestal for 50 something years now. And, um, in a sense, we are still perpetuating the same, uh, the same uh, shenanigans. Because if you look at every December 12th, uh, when we mark our Independence Day, the people who are honored um, um, you know, with national medals are the most crooked people in this society. So, so we are perpetuating uh, this colonial legacy. And, and, and I think fiction does restore some truth to these historical epochs by challenging the well-established narratives to create a new narrative, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that you brought up the baby, um, but, but since we're not, we don't have much time, I, I'd like to talk about that in our next session, which is also about something similar. Um, but the question I'd like to ask now um, is this issue of you know, venerating people who you call fathers, but who in the end kind of end up raping the country. Right. And we've had similar experiences in Nigeria mm. where, you know, you've had military dictators who now come back to contest our civilian presidents and you call them Baba. <laughs> right. So Baba Shege, which is uh, over Central. And now we have Baba Buhari, who is uh, totally clueless, but you still call him Baba. <laughs> right. <laughs> you have this veneration for, for their figures. Um, but in Kenya, you know, for me, there was something interesting I, I kind of realized recently that in 2017 there was an election mm -hmm. between uh, Uhuru Kenyatta and, uh, and uh, Raila Odinga. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe later we'll talk about an interesting story of Raila Odinga um, as it relates to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but what I realized is that Kenyatta was the son of the first president of Kenya mm -hmm. and Odinga was the son or is the son of the first vice president of Kenya. So we have this situation where history seems to be repeating itself and you seem to be trapped in this space, you know. Uh, and you spoke about in Dust, um, about after, after the post-election violence where, you know, Kenya's official language is, is um, English, Kiswahili, and silence. And as a writer, what aspect of this silence do you want to break with your storytelling? 
uh, uh, my uh, my dear friend Mishai Mongol always emphasized, but there was another line, and but there was also memory. Um, I believe that the uh, the memory repository, um, both uh, uh, in the nation and in the lives of those who are part of the nation, whether as citizens or as associates of the nation, um, uh, hold the truth. There's a thing about, uh, you know, even the ghosts and skeletons we bury. Um, even though everyone pretends, you lock that, you lock up the cupboard, there's a kind of understanding that there is, there are skeletons in that cupboard. And at one point, whether it's done now or a hundred years later, there has to be a reckoning with those particular skeletons. And, that, and that's actually the kind of point uh, that the sooner one gets into the, opens the cupboard and allows the air in, uh, it's not as scary as it as it seems. It, it it silences the ghosts, and I think somebody says uh, we 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 need to create the space where the ghosts can become ancestors, so that they can bless us. Um, and uh, I think part of the cycle, that kind of walk, kind of all you know, the paralytic walking around over and over again, and the cycles of you know every five years of violence, comes from the unrequited ghosts, the the ghosts that are, have not been reckoned with. And um, and perhaps I don't um, I don't necessarily dwell in the kind of uh, the colonial past as much as the the post independent past uh, the realities of the things that we have done to each other um, we'd rather talk about what the British did rather than what we have what done what we are doing to ourselves and what we have what we have done to ourselves yeah. Um, so just to, just to uh, give context, um, you know, there was, there was a time we were at a writing workshop and uh, you had Africans, all of us were Africans, I think most of us were Africans, and they have this white Zimbabwean, right, and they have a lot of Zimbabweans there, and every day at dinner would have conversations about what a mess Zimbabwe is, right, and everyone blames the white Zimbabweans, like it's their fault, it's their fault, and this woman was always quiet. And one night she got a bit tipsy and said, you know, you guys have had this country for 30 years. What the fuck have you done with it? I wasn't there, but I came the next morning and everyone was outraged. Like, how dare she say that? She's racist. We're going to have her kicked out of the program. And I was like, what exactly did she say? And they said, oh, this is what she said. And I said, well, haven't we been saying the same thing <laughs> like for the whole week we've been here? So why is it that because she says it and she's white, that becomes a problem? You know, so so there's aspects of our histories that we want to like shift the buck yeah. and keep passing it on to the past. Yes, of course, it's important to kind of analyze this in context of what's happened, mm -hmm. but we should also analyze what have we done with it, which is you know what what your books have been doing with with um, those issues. Yeah, but I will say by the same token, we need to be nuanced in our reading of history because the British never left Kenya. They still control two thirds of the nation's arable lands. You can bear um, uh, that with fact. Uh, so British multinationals still control the rich arable arable land. So when you talk of landless maybe in this country, uh, we're still talking of the fringe of uh, the economy uh, because the agricultural sector, which is the mainstay of the economy, is not controlled by Kenyans. So the tea that you produce, the, the coffee that's produced. Is still uh, decided. The prices are still decided at uh, London auctions. Mm. So, so how can the farmer not control the prices of what he produces, or she produces? And um, it's true. Um, uh, we can uh, we can take responsibility, but uh, let let all our colonial masters in uh, in in Angola, in Mozambique, in uh, in Harare, in Nairobi, let them leave the land to the people. I think um, uh, what, uh, what uh, we have also done is to internalize these colonial nar narratives. And we have to reconstruct those narratives by actually peering through those distortions that don't always reveal um, what, was, uh, what was disinherited from the people and what has never been restored to date. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, so we have just 10 minutes. I have lots of questions for them, but I'll try it open to the audience. So if you have any question, please show of hands. One. Two, okay, three, four. <laughs> very briefly, we'll take the first four. Very brief comments, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, moderator, how are you doing? I am good. Welcome. How far? I am in the twilight of my age. 
I'm not a young man. Peter Kimani is a very good friend of mine. Yvonne, I'm very glad to see you the first time. My name is Max Kahende. You. you heard Ambassador. from me recently. <laughs> she calls me ambassador, yes. I was a civil servant. <laughs> and I rose to that uh, lofty title. I worked in Nigeria. That's why I addressed in that manner. Oh, okay. And uh, I feel really honored to be here today. The discussions which have taken place over the last maybe one hour is something I wish I had when I was growing up. I want to tell the young audience here, you're very lucky. You're very lucky to help Peter Kimani, Yvonne, and others who are telling us that there is something which needs to be done. Our history. Is it distorted history? And if so, to what extent? From that standpoint, we then can correct it. You've been told about people we idolize. I don't know, not want to go back to Kapenguria and other places. Indeed, I'm a decorated person by the government of Kenya. I was not a crook. Kimani. <laughs> <laughs> I did a good job. I was involved in the Uganda peace talks. I was involved in the Sudan peace talks. And I'm proud of what I did that time. So some of us are not crooks. What, what I wanted to let the young people who are here know is that when we were growing up, the distortions of our history was what we were judged upon. If you accepted those distortions, you are brilliant. From our history, who discovered Mount Kenya? Who discovered Kilimanjaro? You had to read these things and, and memorize them brilliant and you get a scholarship to go to places like these people went to. Mm -hmm. I also got my scholarship because I was I was following dutifully what I was being taught by uh, <laughs> those people. <laughs> now in looking at what you have talked about today in placing our writing in the context it deserves so that we can teach especially our young people who we are what is Kenya? We have been told Kenya is not, it's a geographical confine. Yes, we know where it is and it's a political thing. Then who are the Kenyans? Every time we have elections, I'm a Luo, I'm a Kikuyu, I'm a Kalenjin, I'm in this camp, I'm in that camp. And on the basis of that, we fight and kill one another. We were taught by the white people who are here. Sorry for the white people who are here. It's, it's, it's not you I'm addressing, it's your people who did what they did to us. <laughs> that politics is on the basis of divide and rule. Divide and rule. So we remain divided and so we are ruled. The Babas we are talking about, you are told in Nigeria this time it is the Ibos versus the House of Fulani against the Yorubas. Next time is the House of Fulani and the Ibos versus, or like Abiola's time, versus, versus the, the Ibos. And then you, you, you use Chekoma Rige from the other side so that the, the, the elite can continue the way they are. I think the young people have to wake up. I refer you to a chapter in uh, uh, Fanon's book, the wretched of the earth is called pitfalls of national consciousness. I think it's a great foundation for us to start living afresh. For me, as I said, as, as an old man the other day, and Kimani has been of great help to me, I decided to look at this problem from a different angle altogether. I went into history because the present is very confusing. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mr. Ambassador, could you please round up quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I went into history, and I found out that the issue of land we are talking about and colonialism came from people we have idolized, like David Livingstone. He's a saint in our eyes, a missionary, so he was good for our souls, but he came to destroy us. I wrote a book 
called David Livingstone, the wayward vagabond. It's available in the market. You will see my message in that particular book. But I'm very grateful to Peter Kimani, Yvonne, and the others that you are raising the consciousness of the, of, of the young people mm -hmm. so that we can have a better Kenya, a better Africa, on the basis of which we are going to have Africa in essence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes, a quick one. Huh? Mm -hmm. I think this issue of colonization is, should be handled with care, some neurosurgery type of a thing. Mm -hmm. Because the way we handle some of these things explains why some of these countries like Kenya and Nigeria, we are still in the third world countries, while countries like Australia, Singapore, are now tightened you know, economically. Look at how they handled the, 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 the colonization, the independence. Mm. They fought it through diplomacy. They didn't kill these people. Look at South Africa right now, the issue of la the, the land question. How are they going to give foreign direct investment confidence to come and invest in their country, whereas they're promising their citizens that we need to recover any land or business owned by foreigners and give it to you without compensation. Okay? Yeah. So that's my question. So we need to handle these things with care, some diplomacy. We need foreign direct investment. We need yeah. these multinationals. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, Can I yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let me, let me say very, very, very briefly. We don't need foreign direct investment. Africa sustains the world. Yvonne will give you the fact. 76% of the world resources come from Africa. I think it is we who will be investing abroad. Thank you. The challenge, Santos, is this. Um, we, we, uh, uh, I, I, what do you call it? I almost call it an existential laziness, an incapacity to, um, to think, to reimagine ourselves differently. Um, policies and governance structures and systems of, of trade, of even imagination, we prefer to um, import. I do not say the problem is outside. I always prefer to look within. We, are, we refuse to converge to at least think, what do we want? Uh, how many of you, how many of you who are linked to Africa or born in Africa have ever asked yourselves, uh, what does it mean for me to be African today? What do I want of, of Africa in the future? Oh, what does it mean for me to be Kenyan now? Okay, it's, a, it's, it's not a simple question. Because within that question is your own sense, the personal and before we reach to the communal sense of, of imagining what, what, that, uh, what the ideal Kenyan, the ideal place of being African is. And that takes work, and that's work we've never, ever bothered to do. We've never bothered to do that. And the problem is, it starts with us, yes. Yeah, you, you ask about trade policies and things like that, I assure you, we, we've, got, we've got all these incredible thinkers, who are PhD holders and postdoctoral holders, um, uh, sitting in the highest economic institutions of the world, um, who are imbibing policies by Adam Smith and the, and the rest without looking within and asking, what, what is context specific? What, how can we create systems and structures that can actually dominate the world? The work hasn't been done yet. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Uh, my question is on the spectrum of storytelling. So you mentioned how two authors from the same country can tell two entirely different stories, but as a first-time writer, how do you find that voice and where do you build that story and how do you find the community who wants to hear that story told by you? Well, I wish I knew. <laughs> Writing is a very solitary uh, commitment. You, you read, as Ambassador was suggesting, you read your history. You find you are thinking about your condition, as Yvonne is suggesting. And then you start to question uh, the conditions around you. And that will be the trigger for stories that can interrogate uh, you know, your circumstances. So. Uh, I can't quite ex explain the process of these stories. Uh, maybe Abu Bakr might have a better, better way. But I think um, you find 
so developing your own voice takes time um, you know very very long time because for you to be comfortable and to be confident and to be certain that this is how you want to state things will take a lot of um, you know years of uh, craft craft um, what's the word? you have to you have to go through many many hours of writing to get your own voice and I think even after your your first short story or your first novel, you still haven't quite figured your your, your voice. It's going to be an evolution. Um, but as to where your story goes, I think you just do it, and then we'll see where the story leads you. I tend to say that uh, stories are more intelligent than the writers who, who who write them. They'll guide you where where to go. Yeah. Just very quickly, the 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 the, the question of voice is a perennial struggle of the author. So don't be afraid of it. Um, and uh, again, of the policy that a lot of story comes from within. Uh, and so uh, when I'm doing, uh, very rarely does it happen, but when I'm doing a class, I always start with what do you fear the most? Uh, what, 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 what is the shape of your most secret fears? And th that's one whole session. And it's usually a conversation with one other person, a stranger whom you do not know. Um, and the second question, which actually is, one would assume is the easiest, but actually is the most challenging. Is what are the what's the what's the shape of your most secret desire? Um, being able to go deep enough to be truthful enough to uh, respond, find an answer that resonates profoundly, is actually then the beginning of the all the different forces that gather to provide you with with that voice, a voice. But having said that, please remember that um, each story, when it shows up, it shows up with its own kind of sound, its own type of music. And uh, the, the journey of the writer is a never-ending one of starting again, of learning always to be vulnerable before that moment, which is un un unknown and uncertain. So my, my only answer to you is don't be afraid, just start and, and trust the process. You know? Yeah, um, I think you've said practically everything, but I'll just add one sentence. Write from your heart and write with your head. Next question. Oh, good afternoon, everywhere. Okay, <laughs> okay um, I think my question is kind of a general question on the Kenyan history. And what I want to know is, uh, uh, my thought is that there's no history without people, without the human story. And Kenya, as we know, is still a colony. So we don't have a, his a story of our own. Uh, that's my thinking. And my question is for uh, Yvonne and uh, Peter Kimani, as you both um, Kenyan writers who are out there telling our story, is there a Kenyan story, a collective common Kenyan history on the people of Kenya uh, that a child in, let's say, Wajir and a child in Morang and a child in Bomet can collectively own and call their own story, their own history, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you can see Yvonne is passing the buck. <laughs> I mean, we, we have 46 communities in this in this in this country so we need 46 national stories that's what we need and that will be the collective the 46 will be the collective so start with yours write yours i'll write mine if i write hers and um, there will be no contradiction if i borrow from other communities because they're part of our collective and i think that's what we're both trying in our fiction to 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 nullify the myth of this one national history or one national story, their their national histories. So uh, as to as to where um, we are, I think we are a neo colony because you can see we are speaking in English. We are not speaking Kiswahili or or, or Borana or Kiembu or Taita. It's this is the legacy of colonization. It's complex uh, because those who instituted it had thought about it for a long time, and you can see if we we don't start to question what you're doing and how we're doing it will just perpetuate the same legacy yeah no yours is actually a very challenging question um there are shared histories we already have 
uh, you, you know how we gather around national days, how we sit around, we sing the national anthem, that's part of the, part of, part of the shared story. Um, there are things we have in common, six o'clock lowering of the flag, wherever you are, even in the, in the, in the most outer border post, um, it's the same bugles, the same, it's the same moment. So I, I, I think there needs to be a kind of uh, imagination, a grander imagination of recognizing what we actually do already have in common. And, and it's quite a lot, and it's, and, it, and it's, and it's impressive, and it's beautiful. Um, so there, there is that, and that again requires work, the work that I don't see us um, willing to put yet. I mean, it's happening, but it's there already. Uh, that's one. But um, the, I think the second point is, um, I, I have a problem with the valorization of the British settlement, well, the colonial story, only because the histories of our lands are older and bigger and grander. And these are histories that encompass incredible worlds of trade, say, with the entire world through the Indian Ocean, say, say for example, the global monsoon complex. So uh, my preoccupation is bigger than that which has become a, a popular song. Um, I'm curious about the histories of other colonizations. I know that the the people we now know as the Lua were imperial people who invaded this land and took over the lakefront from a whole lot of people. They're in, incredible stories of internal, I don't know, um, movements and I might hesitate to use the word colonizations, <laughs> yeah. but which is far more interesting and makes our lands and, and, and histories and worlds and uh, uh, I don't know, our complexes far more imaginative and, and wild and, uh, and daring. And I imagine that from these worlds, if we dare to look further than, than this, actually a very short period, seven, less than 70 years, um, uh, we, I, I, get, I get tired of the valorization, the privileging of that particular colonial, colonial thing. Like I say, I, I, I'm struck, you know, when you end up in the coast of Kenya, uh, certainly that, you're, you're struck by the immensity and the weight of past, of histories that actually still resonate to, uh, to this particular moment. Uh, I, and, you're, and I suddenly, for me, I got extremely saddened by the, the dying of, this, of those particular mm, worlds. Yeah, so I don't know if it answers your question. Just, just I think the simple answer is that uh, there's a hell of a lot of work to be done. Um, and it's fun. Um, and it's, it may be hard, but it, it'll be, it's a lot of fun. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Wanjeri. And my question comes in at the very end of um, our story when it comes to publishing. Uh, so this is me during my spare time. I walk around bookshops and look at books. And the most attractive books by Kenyan writers and African writers happen to be published abroad. And the least attractive and just are published locally. So my question is, and I think I, I tried to ask this question earlier, is how easy, how challenging or easy is it to publish in Kenya? And I think I've also just looked at um, your book, Peter, and it's published abroad. So are there challenges with publishing locally for writers who have no access to the Western world and would love to write for this context in this, can we get attractive books in the country? What is it that makes publishing so hard locally? Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, I submitted my manuscript, the manuscript of the Jacaranda to a Kenyan publisher at the same time as the New York publisher. And within three weeks, I got a response from New York. I'm still waiting for a response from my <laughs> Arabic publisher. So that tells you how difficult it is to be published in this city. <laughs> Mainly because we become lazy, sloppy, absolutely uh, unimaginative. I've said this before, entitled, because we want to, we want to reap where we don't sow. Uh, I remember uh, my friend Goge Wathiang was in town early in the year, and he said, uh, publishers have to invest Nurture, then harvest. These ones want to harvest without the rest uh, of the processes. So my my experience is that um, 
if uh, a book is not likely to go into the school market, I don't know how they even determine that, um, because they are publishing and endorsing books with swear words and F words for 12-year-olds, for so they don't even read. So you can tell they are not even um, assessing these books on merit. It is corruption, capital C. Uh, so, so, so it's greed, national greed has become a virtue in this country. So young, young minds are being nurtured with nonsensical, you know, trash that, um, you know, I, I can't comprehend, you can feel my, my frustration that, um, you know, my book, because they don't see this as a set book for high school, which means uh, uh, you know several hundred thousand copies each year for four years at least, and then they can wait to bribe again and be given an, another cycle in ten years has no chance. Uh, and yet we have general readers like all of you. You you're here because you're readers. I uh, you know uh, ardent readers. So I think it's um, very limiting. I don't know how our publishers. Uh, I have no apologies, by the way, for any publishers around. <laughs> Take the message from me. I am. Uh, I don't give a, uh, a care at all. I don't want to use my my mom is here. I won't use. <laughs> I won't use other words. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, you can. I've used that word without saying it. You understand? Um, so they lack. Uh, the patience to invest and nurture writers and then they can harvest from their efforts. So uh, it's a very limiting mentality but it's become that's a tenderpreneur menta mentality isn't it? They're waiting for a huge tender from the state and they'll do anything to, uh, to, to get it. So I, I, I was lucky um, because you know I got uh, an agent in New York who got, who got my, my, my publisher quite quickly and I don't know, Yvonne might have a different experience, but um, I no longer care about um, you know Kenyan publishers. I hope you know they can see this book is in the fourth printing, so the world is reading. The story has come from this country, and the people of this country don't feel the confidence to invest in their own. You see the the kind of mentality uh, we're dealing with. So we are still importing these books. Uh, so it's um, so we are enriching now. The foreign direct investment <laughs> is going the other way. We are investing in uh, in New York and London. Uh, my experience was a little different. I was first published by Kwani Kwani Trust, and Kwani did uh, publish a, quite a whole number of books. A, l a few a few of the big authors in the world right now, um, uh, Jennifer. Um, yeah, we're, we're all all started all started off with Kwani, and I I I. I, I I lament the loss of that very potent vision uh, because that vision had incredible resonance all through the continent. But so it means that the seeds of, of, of the particular excellence um, it do exist. And, uh, and for some reason, Nairobi, it's very important that Nairobi does it. Um, that's, that's one. But the second thing was that once Kwani published it, then the world paid attention, started to pay attention. And quite frankly, it was because of the response of the Kenyan um, readers, the, Af the African reader actually, um, uh, that responded and took on these stories that were being put out uh, with such uh, enthusiasm. That's when the re that's when you know that's when the agent comes calling and the publisher comes calling. And who was it that said earlier it's a business? They realize there's a niche market, the African niche market, and there's a global niche market. Um, and for them, it's, a, it's a bottom line: will this book make money for them? Um, but that means then that there is there the possibilities. Uh, I wouldn't even talk about. I think what's important in the telling of this story is that Kwani only emerged in terms of its publishing um, um, side because of the the very things that Peter was talking about the, the established um, Kenyan publishing uh, you know industry. And, and and when and and uh, my, my beloved friend, the late Binyavanga, said basically using F, for F, four letter words, basically says you know, um, with 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 a new generation, a new mentality, there's no way that you can be constrained by gatekeepers. I don't know if that same spirit can be renewed maybe in in another generation. There's a great potential in 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 uh, in a publishing. And certainly Nigeria has proven that that's possible. I have I have to have hope, and I look forward to that uh, to having say my next book published first, as as Dust was first published in in Kenya, by the way, by Kwani. 
uh, this is, I was so de depressed. I tried very hard to have Dragonfly C also published first in Kenya. It just wasn't possible um, uh, at that particular time. But there is hope, I think, um, and there's a, there are possibilities. I can, uh, I can quickly add my next book coming out in February will be published by a London-based publisher, but Nigerian publisher. So we're coming to the continent through, <laughs> through, through London. <laughs> through London. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank so you. That, that will be the last question. Thank you very much. My name is Garnet, and it's a great privilege to be here and to breathe the same air as Peter, Kimani, and Yvonne. Um, those are two of the best books I've read since 2017. Peter, I keep imagining Rajan, the Bugidi King, coming out of you know, Nakuru. It's totally, totally awesome. And Yvonne, um, I've told you what I feel about your book. Um, and I wanted to speak about 2007, 2008, the watershed moment, when you both mentioned that you became introspective about what it meant to be a Kenyan. And uh, I think, Yvonne, you said um, no one wants a person from a failed state or failed nation, you know, as you went into, into Tanzania. And I want to take you back to the idea of East Africa, because Kenya was very much at the forefront um, of East Africa. And before that, and I'll take you back to the colonial construct where there was no Kenya, we were um, conceived as East Africa. The idea was uh, that of East Africa. And if I take you back to the railway, it was the Uganda Railway. The British had a vision. They were going into the Pearl of Africa to find the source of the Nile and to open up because it was linked to the Suez Canal because they wanted to control international trade. We're doing the SGR now, and I keep asking myself, what big vision do we have as a nation, apart from, you know, you hear about 30% and 40%, and, and, you know, the Chinese want to give us money. You know, sometimes, I mean, that is our tragedy, I think, that that big vision that the British had, and for which the British taxpayer paid, I don't know how much, we're, I think right now we're in debt um, to the, if, if that girl who was at the UN the other day about climate change was here, she would say we've sold the next generation and the next and the next because that is the price that we will pay for the SGR. But what big vision do we have for it? Um, but apart from that now, I was going to say, as you went into Tanzania, and for me, we looked into the East Africa community and when it broke up, Kenya broke it up. On a whim, from one of our ministers, they went in there, and since most of the resources were concentrated here, you know, the East Africa, you know, cooperative creameries, the air, airline, the what, you know, we, we thought it was really, really easy. And the arrogance of the Kenyans has been well noted in the region. Yvonne yourself wrote a book called Weight of Whispers, where the Rwandans came into Kenya, and you're the one who told us how they were treated badly. Would they welcome you there? No. Uganda had a long history here when they had the problems with Idi Amin. A lot of them don't even want to talk about that period because Kenya, even though we were the host country, we did not treat people properly. And so in terms of our humanity, even as you have this watershed moment in 2007, 2008, might be that is who we are. And so as we think about ourselves and our identity as Kenyans, I'd like to challenge us to think about our relationships with others, and particularly our neighbors, because when trouble happens at home, it's the neighbor's door you go and knock on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Garnet. But this, uh, and thank you, for, and thank you for the truth. That's part of that's part of this. Those are part of the skeletons, in uh, you know, part of the many skeletons, the generation of skeletons that lurk in our Kenyan cupboards, um, and and uh, perhaps reckoning, having a reckoning with that, in the same way you have allowed us to do right now, means that we can either make amends, atone or try to do better, or not bother at all, and say, okay, we are shits, and this is how we're going to remain. Yeah, thanks for your perspective. I, I think before 2007, people forget that uh, we had dress rehearsals in 1992, 
1997. So they had done practice for, for 10 years uh, in, uh, in um, you know, you know committing, committing atrocities, uh, you know, mass atrocities. And uh, so the Rift Valley, which is the centerpiece of my book as well, uh, I, was, I was trying to restore that humanity because I don't know how a neighbor will rise against a neighbor. Uh, people, they have, uh, you know, core, um, you know, existed for years or for generations. So there is something about, uh, if you read uh, as um, Ambassador was proposing, uh, you know, uh, Fanon, uh, you'll see you see how people who are dehumanized, um, who are dehumanized by a system, will respond to their conditions. And humiliating the humiliated is one of the ways. So uh, we have we have very very um, a British mentality if you think about us and our neighbors, because uh, the East African community. I once, as a journalist, toured the three countries and uh, talked to the people, ordinary hawkers small traders uh, in the three countries and, and what they thought of this grand vision by this African community. That was in 2004, that's 15 years ago. So the technocrats sitting in Arusha have, have no idea what the local man and woman in the streets are thinking. So, uh, but, but this again a replication of the colonial operations, divide and rule. So it's Kenya that orchestrated this uh, ending um, and you have to you have to ask yourself why, because to the west you had Kwame Nkrumah, who had not just an East African or West African federation, but a united Africa. And uh, when the the European Union, if you look at uh, their ten point plan, replicated Kwame Nkrumah's vision for Africa. So they appropriate our ideas, they assassinate uh, the visionaries. So so any visionary who emerges uh, in this continent. And, and again, that's why history is very informative. Uh, you know, Patrice Lumumba, who refused the, the annexation and the, uh, the division of the DRC, did not even last for a few months. Kwame Nkrumah, similarly. You go to um, Burkina Faso, um, all Sankara, you go, you go to Mozambique, you know, Samara Machel. So, so you can see, until we learn from our history, we are bound to repeat those mistakes. But are we even reading our history? I doubt it. Thank you, Peter. And uh, Peter and I will have the opportunity to con uh, continue this conversation later at 4 p.m. You're all welcome to join us. But in the meantime, I'd like to say thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Peter, for being such amazing panelists. And you, thank you Martha. for being such a great, great audience. Um, <laughs> the Makondo Literary Festival continues. So enjoy all the sessions and enjoy talking to people. Thank you. Mm -hmm.